August 7th, 1945, uh, the day after the world's first atomic bomb was dropped at Hiroshima, Norman Cousins wrote an impassioned editorial for Saturday Review, then an influential American political weekly firmly anchored on the liberal side of the opinion spectrum. Entitled, Modern Man is Obsolete, Cousins' editorial gave voice to deep anxieties of many in the early days of the Cold War. Modern technology, it seemed, had produced threats to the human future to which technological man had few, if any, answers. As Cousins wrote, man stumbles fitfully into a new age of atomic energy for which he is as ill-equipped to accept its potential blessings as he is to counteract or control its present dangers. On October 11, 1962, 17 years after Cousins sounded the alarm about the obsolescence of modern humanity, the Second Vatican Council formally opened on October 11th. On October 15th, a mere four days later, President John F. Kennedy was shown photographic evidence that the Soviet Union was surreptitiously in placing offensive nuclear missiles in Cuba, which uh, the warheads of which could destroy Washington, New York, and every other major city on the east coast of the United States in a matter of minutes. It's too rarely been remarked that the first three weeks of Vatican II, weeks of high ecclesiastical drama in which John XXIII called the Catholic Church to a new evangelical activism in the modern world, and the Council Fathers sought to wrest control of the Council's agenda from the Roman Curia, coincided with the Cuban Missile Crisis. By all accounts, the closest the world ever came to a nuclear holocaust in which modern humanity, rather than being rendered obsolete, would be annihilated. Yet here was a coincidence with consequences. The juxtaposition of the Council's opening with the terrifying high point of the Cold War had its effects on the church's life in the years immediately following. The experience of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which threatened to end the work of the Council before the Council had really begun, accelerated the Vatican's quest for a new Ostpolitik, a new relationship with the world of European communism, which would be designed and implemented by Archbishop Agostino Casaroli during the pontificate of Paul VI. The strange coincidence of a world that seemed to be one minute from midnight and the opening of a council intended to create the conditions of a new, for a new Pentecost throughout the world church was undoubtedly one motive behind John XXIII's April 1963 encyclical on the imperative of peace, Pachem in Terrace. It just as certainly formed part of the historical, even psychological, background from which emerged one of Vatican II's most controversial documents known during its development as Schema 13. Schema 13 had distinguished ecclesiastical parentage. John XXIII himself, his successor, Cardinal Giovanni Battista Montini of Milan, and the Belgian Cardinal Leo Joseph Sunens, one of the Council's four moderators. These churchmen wanted the Council to initiate a pastoral dialogue with modernity, with modern humanity full of confidence in its new scientific and technological powers, yet fearing obsolescence, as that quintessential modern man, Norman Cousins, had put it in 1945. Schema 13 was also intended to be the model of a new style of ecclesiastical rhetoric, the rather formal rhetoric of neo-scholastic propositions would give way to a more conversational tone in which the church would make respectful proposals to the modern world aimed at eliciting a dialogical response from rapidly secularizing societies and cultures. After four years of gestational travail in which the Archbishop of Krakow, Karol Wojtyla, played a significant role as one of many midwives, Schema 13 was finally born at the end of the Council's fourth period, just 50 years ago last month, and christened Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. It began with an introductory reflection on the human situation in the contemporary world 
which was followed by two lengthy parts, The Church and Man's Vocation, which continued the analysis of the introduction, and some more urgent problems, which addressed a cluster of specific issues. The structural organization of this second part anticipated the teaching of John Paul II in Centesimus Musanus by describing a tripartite modern society in which politics, culture, and economics are in vigorous interaction. This scheme cleared the path in the development of Catholic social thought to John Paul II's teaching on the free and virtuous society as one composed of a d democratic polity, a free economy, and a vibrant public moral culture, with the last being crucial to the proper functioning of the other two. It's the portrait of the modern world running through Gaudium et Spes on which I want to concentrate here, however. For in addition to analyzing specific issues, the Council Fathers highlighted what seemed to them <clears throat> the principal signs of the times, the chief characteristics of modernity, if you will, to which the proclamation of the gospel had to attend. Gaudium et Spes is a complex document containing many enduring insights. But read from the perspective of today, a mere two generations after it was written, the pastoral constitution also seems curiously, even strangely, dated. Gaudium et Spes is a photographic still, a snapshot of the modern world, and the image conveyed is true enough for 1965. But what the Council Fathers describe as the modern world turns out to have been a modernity that would soon self-destruct because of internal tensions and contradictions the Council did not address. A modernity that would produce not obsolescent modern humanity living under the shadow of global nuclear war, but postmodern humanity. And postmodern humanity is beset by more and arguably graver dangers the Norman Cousins and the Fathers of Vatican II imagined when they pondered a modernity imperiled by its own artifacts and bereft of satisfying answers to the questions its accomplishments raised. There's no need here to belabor the worthy insights in Gaudium et Spes. The sympathetic treatment of the contemporary human quest for freedom, the dialogical approach to the challenge of modern atheism, the celebration of the genuine achievements of science and democracy, the ecclesiology of a church that proposes but does not impose, the touching description of conscience as, quote, the most secret core and sanctuary of man where he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in its depths. Above all, the Council Fathers grasp the nub of the modern dilemma and the root of the modern possibility in their focus on philosophical anthropology, the idea of the human person as the crucial question of the day. These insights remain entirely pertinent to our situation more than two generations after Gaudium et Spes, and we should remain grateful for them. Nevertheless, and in that spirit of gratitude, I'd like to focus for a moment on the things that Gaudium et Spes did not see or did not anticipate with an eye to rescuing the pastoral constitution from an undeserved obsolescence. For it's only when we identify these missing pieces that we can begin to understand why the challenge of postmodernity is even greater than the challenge of late modernity. And it is only from that understanding that we can begin to grasp why the new humanism of John Paul II which was embedded in telegraphic form in key sections of Gaudium et Spes, remains essential for the rescue of the pastoral constitution and for the new evangelization of the 21st century. So, to put the matter bluntly, <clears throat> what did Gaudium et Spes miss in its portrait of what we now call late modernity? And what are the contemporary realities that Gaudium et Spes did not anticipate, but which are crucial components of the postmodern circumstance in which much of the Western world finds itself in these first years of the 21st century. <clears throat> Gaudium et Spes recognized that a revolution in human self-understanding 
had followed Darwin and Freud, just as dramatic changes in our understanding of the cosmos and our place in it had followed the discoveries of Einstein and the other great 20th century physicists. The introductory section of the Pastoral Constitution even suggested that humanity had, Pache Feuerbach, passed through a fiery brook on the far side of which religious conviction must be a matter of personal decision rather than, matter, than a matter of understandings and practices inherited from one's ancestors and one's culture. The Pastoral Constitution did not, however, take the full measure of the effects of the discovery of the DNA double helix by Watson and Crick and the new genetics that would follow. Thus, the Pastoral Constitution did not anticipate that biology and the other life sciences would rapidly displace the hard sciences, like physics, as the sort of Promethean threat to the human future and to human self-understanding. Gaudium et Spes depicted a world in which the chief philosophical challenges to the Christian worldview and to the Christian view of the human person are Marxism and existentialism of the Sartrean variety. Yet Marxism was in the ash can of history within a generation of the pastoral constitution's promulgation, and Sartrean existentialism is studied today, if at all, as a matter of antiquarian interest. Moreover, in surveying the intellectual cultural landscape, Gaudium et Spes does not seem to have discerned that another philosophical challenger, the utilitarian of Jeffrey Bentham, utilitarianism of Jeffrey Bentham and his followers, would mount a more forceful challenge to the Christian view of the human person and to the possibility of a truth-centered public moral discourse than Sartre ever imagined. Gaudium et Spes welcomed the new roles that women were assuming throughout the world and has important things to say about marriage and the family. But the pastoral constitution does not seem to have anticipated the harder-edged forms of the new feminism that would break out into mainstream culture a few years after Vatican II. Nor does Gaudium et Spes seem to have expected the emergence of the two-worker family in which both parents are wage earners and the changes that would affect in family life. Nor did the pastoral constitution anticipate the global plague of abortion, nor did it anticipate the gay rights movement and what would become a historically unprecedented worldwide struggle over the very definition of marriage. In short, Gaudium et Spes gave few, if any, hints that a new Gnosticism teaching the radical plasticity of human nature was about to hit the world like a cultural tsunami, a Gnosticism that married to the biological, biotechnological revolution produced by the new genetics proposes to remake the human condition by manufacturing or remanufacturing human beings. Focused in part on the destructive capabilities of modern weaponry, Gaudium et Spes does not anticipate the threat to the human future embodied in what Leon Cass has called the immortality project of the new genetics and the new biotechnologies, despite the warnings that had been raised by Aldous Huxley 30-some years before in Brave New World. The pastoral constitution does acknowledge that it is, quote, in the face of death that the riddle of human existence becomes most acute and suggests that, quote, the prolongation of biological life is unable to satisfy the deepest desires of the human heart. But the council fathers do not seem to have anticipated that this prolongation was on the verge of becoming virtually infinite, a technological development with the most profound consequences for human self-understanding and for society. Gaudium et Spes sympathetically explored modern humanity's crisis of religious faith and rightly suggested that the church's failures had to be taken into account when analyzing the roots of modern agnosticism and atheism. <clears throat> but Gaudium et Spes did not anticipate the demise of the secularization hypothesis, the once taken for granted claim that modernization inevitably leads to secularization, which has now been empirically falsified in every part of the world except Europe and its former colonies in Canada and Australasia. 
Gaudium et Spes does not, in other words, imagine a world that is becoming more religious and in which religious conviction is having a determinative effect on world politics. Yet that is the world in which we live, a world in which inter alia radical forms of Islam like jihadism have changed the way each of us lives, works, and travels. The Council Fathers noted that population growth was putting social, economic, and spiritual pressures on many societies and tried to respond in a pastorally sensitive way. But there is no hint in Gaudium et Spes that overpopulation, whatever that means for the term is essentially undefinable, would turn out to be a myth. Nor is there any suggestion that one of the gravest problems of the 21st century would be a precipitous drop in fertility across the globe, led by a Europe for whose lack of children a new demographic term, lowest low fertility, had to be invented. The Council Fathers were not, of course, anti-natalist scientific charlatans like Paul Ehrlich, whose 1968 book, The Population Bomb, did much to popularize the threat of overpopulation. But Gaudium et Spes depicted a world in which uh, too many people with too few resources is the norm and projected that norm into the foreseeable future. The pastoral constitution, in other words, did not anticipate what seems likely to be the mid-20th century reality, which, in the aggregate, will be one of too few people in a world of expanding wealth. Moreover, that wealth will be expanded because of something else that Gaudium et Spes did not anticipate. The Silicon Revolution, the rise of the Internet and other new communications media, and indeed the entire phenomenon of communications-driven globalization that the world would soon become, for economic purposes, a single time zone world in which virtually everyone is in real time communication with everyone else is not something a reader of Gaudium et Spes in 1965 would have learned. Gaudium et Spes did not anticipate that vast numbers of human beings would in fact lift themselves out of poverty in the late 20th century such that by the first decade of the 21st century, some five-sixths of the world would be unpoor or well on the way to becoming unpoor, while the bottom billion would be mired in abject poverty in considerable part because of something else Gaudium et Spes did not anticipate, the fantastic corruption and incompetence of post-colonial governments uh, in the third world. In light of the revolutionary upheavals of the late 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, and mindful of the charge, however false, that the Church of 1789 was essentially a department of the Ancien Regime, the Council Fathers recovered a Gelasian theme from the distant past of the Church's teaching about civil authority and lifted up the legitimate autonomy of the secular. But the pastoral constitution did not anticipate the emergence of a radical secularism that would seek to enforce a public arena shorn of religious and moral reference points to the point of imposing what Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger called on April 18, 2005, the dictatorship of relativism. Then there was the Council Fathers' call in Gaudium et Spes for a new intellectual synthesis focused on the cultivation of wisdom, surely a worthy goal. Yet within a decade and a half, <clears throat> the very idea of synthesis in the world of learning would be displaced by theories of the inevitable fragmentation and incoherence of knowledge. Similarly, the Council Fathers had some kind things to say about modern art, seemingly innocent of any concern that the avant-garde might soon decay into new forms of decadence. In terms of international affairs, Gaudium et Spes suggested that economic inequality would be the primary causus belli between nations in the future. Yet it's hard to think of very many wars caused by economic inequality or the desire to plunder resources since 1965. Rather, the world's wars in the five decades following Gaudium et Spes 
would be caused by ideological conflict and passion, ancient ethnic, racial, and tribal hatreds, and or distorted religious conviction, aided and abetted by the failures of the United Nation, nations in which Gaudium et Spes repose considerable confidence, <clears throat> and the disinclinations of the former colonial powers to impose a measure of the tranquility of order in the places they once ruled, like Rwanda and Sudan, or that were once their close neighbors, such as Yugoslavia. Perhaps most tellingly, <clears throat> Gaudium et Spes suggested that an intellectually assertive atheism would continue to pose a particularly sharp challenge to the church, when in fact a massive religious indifferentism, described by the orthodox scholar David Bentley Hart as metaphysical boredom, would soon descend <clears throat> over Christianity's heartland like a thick choking fog. Gaudium et Spes anticipated the possibility of a new respectful dialogue between belief and unbelief. It did not anticipate that Catholic proposals for such a dialogue would be received with a big yawn of indifference in cultures whose deepest civilizational subsoil was once tilled by the church. Gaudium et Spes argued that, quote, atheism must be accounted among the most serious problems of this age, yet the problem would in fact be much worse. Boredom in both its spiritual and metaphysical forms, a debonair indifference to the question of God, and a stultifying lack of awe and wonder at the very mystery of being, would turn out to be far more lethal and far more effective challenge to the biblical view of the human person than scientific atheism or existentialism ever was. <clears throat> and the net result in the Western world at least, not an, absent, not an obsolescent modern man of the sort imagined by a secular analyst like Norman Cousins and the Fathers of Vatican II, but postmodern humanity, metaphysically indifferent, spiritually bored, demographically barren, skeptical about the human capacity to know the truth of anything with certainty, rigorously relativistic in morals, willing to impose that relativism on others through coercive state power, and determined to live according to the conviction that personal autonomy is the highest expression of the human. Modern man may have been obsolete in 1945 or 1965, but what came next was even worse. <coughs> Excuse me. What then are we to make of these multiple failures to read accurately the signs of the times? Do they suggest a certain naivete about modernity, as Joseph Ratzinger suggested several times in commentaries on Gaudium et Spes? Was the very idea of a document like Gaudium et Spes misbegotten? as Tracy Rowland and others in the camp of radical orthodoxy imply. Is Gaudium et Spes hopelessly antiquated, 50 years after its publication? Read from the vantage point of today, Gaudium et Spes does seem to utter, does seem to suffer from a kind of historical myopia. The document's description of the key challenges of the modern world shed some light on the situation in the period 1945 to 1965, but that analysis does not anticipate, much less describe, the end of late modernity and the rise of postmodernity that followed the flashpoint of 1968. Yet the pastoral constitution's analysis is both correct for its time and prescient with reference to the impending future on what is perhaps the crucial point. In both the late modern world of Vatican II and the postmodern world of today, the anthropological question is fundamental. And that, interestingly enough, is the question Carol Wojtyla, who would become Pope John Paul II, wished the Council to address right from the very beginning. The first volume of the multi-volume acts, the Acta of the Second Vatican Council, make fascinating reading because they're a collection of submissions 
to the Conciliar Anti-Preparatory Commission, which was charged with formulating an agenda for the Council, and asked the world's bishops, seminary faculties, and religious superiors for ideas. Some submissions to the Anti-Preparatory Commission show genuine insight into the Church's condition, ad intra and ad extra. They reflect a sense that a good, self-critical stock-taking and serious pastoral reform were in order in the Catholic Church. Other submissions, perhaps the majority, suggest that many of the world's bishops expected a brief, virtually pro forma council focused on matters of internal ecclesiastical housekeeping. Thus, the bishops would come to Rome for a few months, ratify a few adjustments in church practice, and return home by Christmas, their business done. The tensions between these two visions of Vatican II, of what Vatican II should be, were the matrix, of course, of some of the high drama in the Council's opening weeks. For as one of the curially experienced reformers among the Council Fathers, Cardinal Montini, who would become Pope Paul VI, put it to a friend on the night that John XXIII announced his intention of summoning an ecumenical council, quote, this holy old boy doesn't realize what a hornet's nest he's stirring up. Like many bishops, the young auxiliary bishop of Krakow touched on pastoral matters in his submission to the Anti-Preparatory Commission. Wojtyla discussed the possibility of a vernacular liturgy. He urged a new sense of priority in ecumenism, the need for Christian education of the laity, a reform in the intellectual and cultural formation of priests before and after ordination. Yet the heart of Bishop Carol Wojtyla's response to the queries from Rome was a kind of philosophical essay. What he asked was the human condition today. What do people expect to hear from the church and what do they need to hear from the church? What the modern world needed, Wojtyla suggested, was an integral vision of the human person nobler and more comprehensive than any other understanding then on offer. The Western humanistic project, he argued, had gone off the rails in recent centuries. Defective, truncated, even demonic ideas of human nature, human community, human origins, and human destiny were everywhere. The most lethal of those false ideas created the cultural conditions for the possibility of the civilizational catastrophes of the first half of the 20th century. Why, Wojtyla asked, had a century that had begun with such high expectations for the human future, produced two world wars, a cold war that threatened the very survival of humanity, oceans of blood, mountains of corpses, the gulag, Auschwitz, and the greatest persecution of Christianity in two millennia, and all of that between 1914 and 1960. The abattoir, the slaughterhouse of the 20th century, Bishop Wojtyla proposed, had been made possible by desperately defective ideas of who the human person is, which led to distorted human aspirations and grotesque political projects. Others knew that the anthropological question was central, Wojtyla acknowledged, even if their answers were deficient. Scientific positivists, dialectical Marxists, and literary existentialists all imagined themselves humanists. Each thought that his method and his insight would lead humanity to a new and genuine liberation. What did the church have to say to all of this? After two millennia, the world had questions to put to the church, he wrote. What is the church's idea of the human person? What is Christian humanism? How does it differ from the many other humanisms on offer in the modern world? Can Christian humanism answer the burning questions that naturally arise in the human heart? Questions that are part and parcel of the struggles of a material creature with intense spiritual longings. Bishop Carol Wojtyla, in other words, <clears throat> proposed that the entire project of Vatican II be organized around the anthropological question. The council was meeting, he wrote, in the middle of a century that prided itself on its humanism. Yet humanism was manifestly in crisis and had been for decades, if not centuries. 
the promise of salvation through ultra-mundane humanism had led to grief and slaughter time and again. Accepting the Great Commission of Matthew 28 in these circumstances meant nothing less than mounting a cultural rescue operation. Thus, Voitua suggested that the Church's central task at Vatican II was to think through a Christian anthropology adequate to the demands of Christian humanism in an age in which humanism's decay had led to lethal consequences. To this task, Wojtyla brought the philosophical anthropology he had developed over two decades of reflection, teaching, and writing. Wojtyla's new humanism grew from three sources, and at the risk of oversimplification, its sources and main ideas can be summarized as follows. First, from his readings in St. John of the Cross, Carol Wojtyla took the view that the distinctive characteristic of human existence is our interiority, which has its roots in the origins of every being in God. Thus, for Wojtyla, modernity's turn to the subject, properly understood, is a turn toward God. Cartesian subjectivity, at least as understood by Descartes' most influential followers, such as Hume, led only to the self. Wojtyla's concept of subjectivity was such that the turn need not bracket or dismiss the transcendent dimension or the question of God. Rather, the turn to the subject, rightly taken, opens up the question of God. Secondly, from Thomas Aquinas, Carol Wojtyla took a realistic ontology that would secure the epistemological foundation of his new humanism. His philosophical anthropology was built on a trust in human experience on, on, and on rationally defensible convictions about the human capacity to get at the truth of things, however incompletely. Thus it posed a challenge to the post-Kantian and especially post-Cumian hermeneutics of suspicion, which had had such a corrosive effect on the humanistic project. From Aquinas, Wojtyla also learned that philosophical anthropology was a matter of both and both the masters of the old Western philosophical tradition and contemporary questions and answers should be in play in Christian reflection, indeed in any serious philosophical reflection on the question of the human person. Thus, Wojtyla's new humanism would reject the self-regarding presentism of too much contemporary thought. By contrast, the new humanism would practice the ecumenism of time. Finally, Wojtyla took from Aquinas a determination not to be reductive. The task of philosophical anthropology was to see, probe, and understand the human person in his or her full complexity. Thus, the spiritual dimension of human experience must be part of any genuinely humanistic account of the human condition. <clears throat> Finally, from Max Scheler and others in the early phenomenological movement, Wojtyla learned that feeling and sensibility can disclose metaphysical and moral truths, and that this, too, was part of dealing with the human person in full. Carol Wojtyla deepened his exploration of philosophical anthropology in his graduate-level Lublin lectures during the mid and late 1950s. These lectures involved a dialogue with some of the great thinkers of the past, Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, Kant, Hume, and Scheler. And interestingly enough, in anticipation of one of the challenges of postmodernity I cited a moment ago, Wojtyla also in analyzed Bentham and utilitarianism during this period, when I think we can safely assume that Je Jeremy Bentham was not a well-known figure in immediately post-Stalinist Poland. And if there was a focal point around which Wojtyla's explorations and philosophically, philosophical anthropology pivoted, it was the question of freedom. Now, this was a question with a certain existential urgency, of course, given the realities of life in communist Poland in the immediate post-Stalin period. Here, Wojtyla honed his claim that communism's economic and political failures were based on a fundamental anthropological error. 
At the same time, Wojtyla sharpened his philosophical understanding of human freedom by analyzing the defects of the moral theories of Kant, deformed by a certain rationalistic reduction, and Shaler, deformed by a certain emotivist reduction. The net result was a Thomistically grounded yet thoroughly contemporary ontology and phenomenology of freedom that was positioned to challenge both the false humanisms of late modernity and the postmodern reduction of freedom to a matter of individualist autonomous choice. Thus, for Wojtyla, a truly human freedom is, to borrow a phrase from the Dominican moral theologian Servet Pinker's, freedom for excellence. Freedom is a matter of freely choosing what we can know to be true, know to be good, and doing so as a matter of moral habit. Against the assumptions of postmodernism, which as Pinker shows, are actually rooted in an Occamite voluntarism, freedom is not to be understood as a free-floating faculty of choice that can legitimately attach itself to anything. This, for Wojtyla, is a dehumanizing concept of freedom. Rather, freedom is a capacity in which, into which individuals, cultures, and societies grow. On this analysis, what postmodernity would come to call autonomy is in fact a prison with bars of solipsism and locks of ignorance. Because of that, the postmodern autonomy project leads to both auto-enslavement at the personal level and relativism imposed by authoritarianism at the societal level. This rich theory of freedom is at the heart of Wojtyla's new humanism, and it is crystallized in the two most quoted passages from Gaudium et Spes in the Magisterium of John Paul II. Gaudium et Spes 22, it is only in the mystery of the word made flesh that the mystery of man truly becomes clear. Christ the Lord, Christ the new Adam, and the very revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love fully reveals man to himself and brings to light his most high calling. And Gaudium et Spes 24, man can discover his true self only in a sincere giving of himself. These two passages from Gaudium et Spes, which I suspect Wojtyla wrote himself, encapsulate what Wojtyla would call, in a 1974 lecture at an international symposium on the seventh centenary of the death of Thomas Aquinas, the law of the gift. And the law of the gift was at the center of the moral and indeed ontological truth about the human person. We are made for freedom, which means that our lives must be lived as the gift for others that life itself is to each of us. For Wojtyla the Christian, the ultimate ground of the law of the gift was the interior life of the Holy Trinity, which imprints itself ad extra on the human person as the imago Dei. Yet, Wojtyla, the philosopher, was persuaded that one could get to the law of the gift, rationally and reasonably, through a serious reflection on human moral agency, a turn to the subject that did not lead to solipsism and autonomy, but to love and responsibility. Freedom, lived according to its proper dignity, is always freedom tethered to truth and ordered to goodness. As Pope John Paul II, Wojtyla would develop this concept of freedom and deepen the new humanism encoded in Gaudium et Spes 22 and 24 throughout his pontificate. Freedom for excellence, for example, is the central organizing idea of the 1991 social encyclical Centesimus Annus, an encyclical that not only looks back at the heritage of post-Leonine Catholic social doctrine, but looks ahead to the postmodernity of the immediate future and presciently anticipates some of the major challenges of a world in which history has clearly not ended. John Paul II's Theology of the Body, laid out in his Wednesday Catechesis from 1979 through 1984, is perhaps the Catholic Church's most compelling response to the new Gnosticism of postmodernity and challenges postmodern humanity to, to, to rediscover human sacramentality 
and the sacramentality of the world. Not only does the church take our human embodiedness as male and female far more seriously than postmodern Gnostics, John Paul II suggested the church's sacramental vision of human embodiedness linked to freedom for excellence sheds important light on some of the most deeply controverted issues of our time. In Veritatis Splendor, John Paul II challenged the moral relativism that is central to the autonomy project by an appeal to the dignity of conscience as central to human dignity. In Fides et Ratio, John Paul challenged postmodern humanity to grow up, to leave the sandbox of metaphysical and epistemological skepticism, and in doing so to break through to a new, genuinely mature humanism that would be proof against the temptations of spiritual boredom. Then there is the new catechism promulgated by John Paul II in 1992 with the apostolic constitution Fidei Depositum. The very fact of the catechism of the Catholic Church is a challenge to postmodernism's insistence on the incoherence of knowledge. Here, the Church proposes is a comprehensive and coherent account of what we believe, how we pray, and how we think we ought to live. And with the Catechism, the Church proposes a question to the world. Which, alter which of these two alternatives strikes you as the more deeply humane? The Church asks post-modernity. The vision of human nature and possibility we propose or a life in which material wealth is coupled with spiritual boredom and moral insouciance. Finally, mention should be made of the impact of John Paul II's new humanism or personalism on key theological themes of the pontificate. His Christology, as evidenced from the beginning in the encyclical Redemptor Hominis, his ecclesiology and his theory of Christian mission in Redemptoris Missio, his sacramental theology in Ecclesia de Eucharistia and Novo Millennio in Aunte, his dialogical approach to ecumenism in Unum Sint and to interreligious dialogue in Redemptoris Missio again, his treatment of the priesthood in Pastores Dabo Vobis, and his theory of Catholic higher education in Ex Corde Ecclesiae. Personalism, the new humanism, and freedom for excellence were also decisive factors in the social teaching of John Paul II, beginning with his innovative theology of work in Labrum Exercens, continuing with his definition of a right of economic initiative in Solicitudo Re Socialis, and culminating in his empirically sensitive treatment of the dynamics of the free economy in Centesimus Annus. This new humanism of John Paul II is a living thing a growing body of thought that must be nurtured and developed by the late Pope's intellectual disciples in the decades ahead if the Church is to respond adequately to the anthropological question that lies at the heart of so many postmodern dilemmas. Such a development must also reckon with some of the serious questions that have been put to John Paul's personalism by sympathetic critics and faithful Catholics. Granted that Wojtyla's personalist approach to a new humanism works well in promoting an integral vision of the human person, in giving content <clears throat> to the notion of human dignity, in catechizing the sacraments and unpacking questions of sexual ethics, <coughs> excuse me, in fostering ecumenical and interreligious dialogue, and even in explicating doctrines such as the Trinity, does the personalist approach work quite as well when issues of state power are engaged? What, for example, does the new humanism have to say when international conflicts become simply intractable and further negotiation is both futile and dangerous? Does John Paul II's new humanism lead, in other words, to a functional pacifism that retains the church's tacit adherence to the just war tradition while de facto putting the church in opposition to virtually every imaginable use of armed force. Is a dignitarian personalist approach to capital punishment the last word to be said on that difficult subject? Theologians sympathetic to John Paul's 
personalism have also raised concerns about its methodological effects in moral theology. Pastoral experience suggests that a personal approach to the central teaching of Humanae Vitae is far more successful than the Thomistic teleology in which Paul VI framed that teaching. Yet does such an approach tend over time to weaken the church's sense of the ontological dimensions of the moral law? <coughs> Christological and eschatological questions are also engaged here. Could the late pope stress in his magisterium on the person of Christ, whose ministry embodies in a perfect way the law of the gift, lead to a kind of ecclesial forgetting of the sovereignty of the risen Lord, who is the world's judge as well as its servant? Or in a related matter, <clears throat> does the purification in purgatory, stressed by the pope's personalism, minimize the penal dimensions of that purification so beautifully expressed, <coughs> excuse me, for example, in elements of the funeral liturgy and in Dante's Purgatorio. Grappling with these questions will not vitiate but rather strengthen the claim that the new humanism of John Paul II manifest in both his philosophical and theological personalism is a uniquely valuable resource for responding to the anthropological question, which, as the fathers of Vatican II saw, was central in parsing the human condition in the modern world. It is just as valuable a resource for the postmodern world that Gaudium et Spes seems not to have seen hovering just beyond the immediate horizon. The philosophical and theological anthropology of John Paul II, defined and developed, <coughs> uh, developed and refined, is thus the key to the rescue of the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world from imprisonment in the dungeon of the 60s to which some of its critics and not a few of its contemporary friends have consigned it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.